first of all, thank you. I know it's a crazy time. I know you're incredibly busy. So it's just, I'm so grateful that you made time that we can, you know, see each other, speak to each other today. So thank you. I really appreciate that. Honestly, when I was reading up your bio, it was exhausting just reading it. Like you have, for someone so young, you've accomplished so much, right? So why don't we start with, for anybody who doesn't know who you are or why we're talking, when, how would you introduce yourself if you had to introduce yourself? Because I know you speak a lot. So how would you introduce yourself? Yeah. I feel as though, I mean, like everything that's happened in my life, I'd say is a, as a result of prayer. So I think that I am somebody who has been the way I describe myself is that obviously I'm a communicator, but I feel as though I'm a communicator with purpose. And I always want to be somebody who's opening doors or leading ways or connecting people. That's really what my heart is Um, for all intents and purposes. Formerly I'm a Pan-African broadcaster. I am a creative industry specialist. I believe in the power of the creative industry. And I think we don't use it enough in the continent. Um, I am a, you know, I'm, I'm the MD of She Speaks Africa, which is my new project. Um, you know, and under it is the Africa Whisperer, which is a, a name that I got from a friend of mine who I'm coincidentally working with now in Ghana. Um, yeah, and I'm just somebody who is extremely passionate about the continent. I'm extremely passionate about the opportunities and the possibilities. And yeah, I think I'm a bit of a global citizen as well. So I don't know, I'm many things to many people. And then, of course, there's the hip-hop stuff, which will never leave me, as you can see. It's, not bad. it's, it's a funny the thing. Queen. Oh, I know. But it's a funny thing, depending on where it is. So if you're interviewing somebody really important, like somebody said to me that, you know what, Leslie, because that's what is my full name. They say, Leslie, when you go in and you interview like this person or that person, just wear heels and then you won't slouch back into your whole like, so you know what I mean? <laughs> so, it's an interesting thing. So let's talk about, because you just mentioned in your introduction of yourself that you're working on a new venture. So tell me about that because the name sounds so fascinating. Yeah. So basically, She Speaks Africa was a, a concept idea that dropped in my spirit um, there was a one day and it was mainly because I've done so much work and it's been varied within Africa. So I've done everything from um, facilitating panels and conversations around agriculture, women's role in agriculture, to the tech space, to traveling for uh, Standard Bank on Africa Connected and just talking about business, innovation, what's possible to understanding political and cultural nuances, which are how people make decisions in different countries, um, to producing TV content and being an exec producer, um, you know, just doing all of that work, to traveling to the States, um, doing work around African music, um, to hitting up Channel O Africa, uh, to being one of the exec producers for Big Brother Africa and all of this. And then just on a personal level, my family spends a lot of time traveling and I, I've had friends and I have friends from all around the continent. Just a side note, my older sister lived in Zimbabwe and went to school in Bulawayo for what it's worth. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So because of that, I started to realize that perhaps my gifting was understanding and being able to understand people within the continent. So I can look at a political situation and outside of being able to make a, f- a few calls, I can understand the culture and the people and the nuances and be able to accurately be like, okay, well, this is what's actually happening. Or I can give a company business strategies and say, well, this is the way that you need to go. Or I can create content um, that will speak to not just people in one country, but if you're not from that particular country or if you're not from the continent, you'll be able to look at some of the stuff that's been produced and get an understanding of the continent and of the, the country. So, yeah, so that's where the name She Speaks Africa came from. So I have all these different projects. Um, there's a young lady who I now manage, or I should say brand manage. She is 27. She owns an orchestra. She is part of the LGBTQIA community. She comes from, um, you know, she's just had this phenomenal life and she is now studying piano. She plays the trumpet and she's a conductor. So I'm just really, yeah, I'm working on a, on a major project with her. She's phenomenal. Um, her name is Offensa Pizze. 
And then I also work with Siko Say, who is now also my business partner. We have a, a, a publication coming out called Beauty After 30. Um, and that's a hybrid of Creative Inc. and um, and Sasha OK, Sasha Oko, sorry, and Siko Say. So we're all coming together with that concern. So I have different things I'm working on, and it's about creating um, projects that represent Africa in multifaceted ways. And then I also work with a brand called Pini in Ghana, and that's all around shea butter because I believe in this whole um, idea of just beauty coming from a very natural space. And yeah, so and it's been good to my skin. I hope you can see my glow. I, oh, I see the glow. I see the glow. <laughs> And that's so, you know what, I love what you said about how multifaceted we are as Africans. And yet, I think perhaps it's just opportunity, perhaps it's mindset, where we've not necessarily, I feel like, really fully tapped into the creative side. Like, what can we do? or How how do we start to really channel all the creativity that is available to us on the continent? I mean, um, so firstly, if I if I tend to name drop, it's not because I'm trying to name drop. I just have to exp- articulate certain stories. So I recently just was a, a keynote speaker for for AU Nepad, and the CEO of AU Nepad was on there. Um, and the topic was around, the broader topic was around how media could basically effectively communicate messages around COVID-19. Uh, and I was speaking to somebody because I have somebody who helps me with my communication because I because I have to go into different spaces. I'm not ashamed to say I'm like if I'm stepping into a space, I'm just like Sandy, help me through this. Her name is Sandy, coincidentally. So as we were talking, I said to Sandy, I said, well, I really don't know what I'm even going to say. I don't understand any of this. So she says to me, well, just speak from an honest space because um, people think of the creative industry, media as just being hard news. And it's actually the entire spectrum. It's the comedians, it's the musicians, it's it's the film. It's in that conversation, I literally, you know, I started to say to them about how um, for media and broadcast in the creative industry, we don't actually take enough advantage of what the power that we have in the continent, you know. Um, and, and I said that even with regards to getting messages around COVID-19, I don't see why organizations like AU Nepad and so forth are not collaborating with comedians. They have the ability to make content go viral. You know, um, there's all of that. I feel as though culture and music and fashion is almost like a time capsule of where we are as people, the good, the bad, and the ugly, you know, um, messages don't have to be delivered in the most serious way. They can be just delivered basically reflecting the energy and the vibe of a particular time and era. Uh, you know, more than anything else. And and I also was talking to a lot of my friends, obviously being in Ghana, the Africa free trade agreement is like a huge thing because it's the home of it. And, you know, Ghana is like Pan-Africa country and all of that. And, you know, I've had like conversations and I've been in the room with very um, significant people where I've just been like, we don't really understand that even for the free trade agreement to happen, we culturally need to have a shift as Africans. It's not just about the policy and what the AU does and all of this. Culturally, there needs to be a shift. I feel as though music, food, fashion, um, all of that has uh, movies, everything has done a great job in uniting us in ways that politics can't do. So I try to I try to be the bridge between because I live in both worlds. So I'm trying to be the bridge between those two worlds. And I think that culturally, I think that people need to understand that culturally, if we're going to have a united Africa, we are going to need the creative industry, no doubt. If we're going to have the free trade agreement actually work, especially when you see some of the politics happening with some of the countries and so forth, we need the creative industry to be involved. It's it's not even like an option. It's it's definitely. And then when you look at countries like you, uh, um, Nigeria, for example, I mean, what they've been able to do with rebranding Nigeria purely off the creative industry is second to none. And for me, when I think of creative and culture, I think of everything, including tourism. We need to find a way that we bring this all together because that's who we are as people. The world has recognized what we have culturally as Africans and everybody will get upset if Beyonce does something. I'm just like, well, who was doing it here? And unfortunately, which one African artist can do it that we'll all be okay with? The point is we all just start shooting, you know, shooting our shots the minute somebody does something. So that's my whole thing. And by the way, I love Black is King. I'm not getting to that debate, but it is what it is. Um, but yeah, I think I think that. And I think that, uh, oh, another thing, somebody told me that I'm a cultural anthropologist, so I'm going to take that. <laughs> I'll put that in my intro. 
<laughs> an African cultural anthropologist. My sister will, she'll just roll her eyes inward. She's just like, you can't just make up names. But then again, my family, they all extremely learned. And then there's me. So they're just like, you know, Leslie, you can't just be telling people this. I said, yes, yes, I can. Obama said, I can, I can do it. Yes, you can. <laughs> <laughs> Leslie, when you were a kid, like, what were you like as a kid? Describe to me what Leslie was as a little girl growing up. I think I was very much the way that I am now. Um, I think there was times when I was extremely, like, either quiet and, like, like very quiet and very uh, kind of introverted. But then I also was the life of like many parties. I remember that. Um, so I just think I was just always like milling about. I'd be at the party. Sometimes I wanted to dance at the Ugandan party. Sometimes I didn't. I think I've always been a little bit inquisitive, overly mischievous, you know, and just the different child. Um, I, I have a thing where I can go in and out of eating meat. And then my dad literally said about a few years ago, he says, oh, everybody should leave my daughter, my European daughter alone. And then he turns to me and he said to me, he says to me, Nabunya, don't worry. When you were a child and would be visiting Jaja Mama, that's my grand, my grandmother, my grandfather, my judges, uh, were, we had like chickens, you know, and, and all of this. And I, I gave all of the chickens names. And then I used to call them my toys. And then one day I said to my dad, I said, daddy, my toys, they're gone. And one of my toys were basically eating them for dinner. <laughs> so I think, yeah, but I think I would like to think I was a burst of joy for everybody and the kind of person that nobody knew what was what I was going to say. Um, and I think I'm very much still like that. So I think mischievous, I think very different. I'm pretty different to my sisters. I mean, we sound the same at times. We look the same a bit, but our personalities are a little bit extremely different. It's like them and me. As a kid growing up, what did you want to be when you grew up? I mean, I, I grew up like very close to my dad. So I'm like a dad's girl. Um, and so my dad is a doctor. And so I wanted to be a doctor. But you wouldn't want me as your doctor. Let's just put it that way. It why was not? not? Going- like, why not? No, no, no. No, no. So you wanted to be a doctor because of the influence of your dad. But was there a part of you, like I, I imagine at school, you must have been very good at things like debate and, and you oh, know. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah, things. Yes. Listen, I was, I was, I've just been bragging on this to people. I, every time we would go into debates, because I went to Hyde Park High School and then sometimes we would, would debate against the boys' schools like kids and everything. And they, it's like all guys, they would make me the summator because I'm just like, let me finish this business because <laughs> I can argue on tap, right? Um, yeah, so I think, I, I mean, in school, I was involved in debating, society, public speaking. I was, oddly enough, a cheerleader. Uh, I played um, netball. I played first team netball. I played club netball. I played area netball. I was actually pretty good. There was a time I thought I was going to be a professional netball player, but then my height whatever um there was a time I thought I was going to be a dancer uh David Matemela was one of my trainers uh and I did uh, when Alvin Ailey came to South Africa some of the 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 instructors I actually danced with them and then the night that I was meant to perform at at Arts Alive I had a solo a glass fell onto my foot I still had the stitch on my foot and then that's when I was like well I'm not going to do this and so how did you get into DJing? Because that was kind of, was that the first, your first step into kind of the, the whole entertainment industry? Was it through DJing? No, I used to be a dancer. I promise you. <laughs> so um, people like Loiso Bala and them, like um, I actually dance and choreograph for him. Oddly, I promise you. It's like, if you see Loisa now, he'll just be like, yeah, no, it was serious. Um, even at church, uh, I was part of the choir at church. And then um, we had like the youth group. And then I was one of the lead vocalists. I basically ended up on radio because I, because now I was dancing with Loiso and them and, and so forth. And so I was meeting all these people like TKZ, so random. Like I'm a Ugandan girl and I'm meeting these people. Um, and then I, somebody told me about YFM because it had just come up and I think it was maybe two or three years in, I can't remember. And then, no, actually it was maybe four years in and I had not heard about it. And then somebody was like, oh, you need to listen to YFM. They always play like great hip hop and everything. So I'm just like, okay, cool. And then I listened and then I decided I wanted to be on YFM. So um, I was doing a BA Dramatic Arts at University. It was my first year out of um, high school. I started an art degree, which 
by my dad's standards was not a degree at all. <laughs> I love you, daddy. And then, yeah, I ended up on YFM. I got a call from Bad Boy and I never left. But before that, Fresh had me doing traffic on his show because I stood in for a friend of mine. It was all made to be just a joke and a means to an end. And, well, look where it got me. <laughs> what, so you've, like I said at the beginning, like you've done so many things so you've achieved so much. Like, what would you say? What stands out to you if, if you had to say at this point? Because I know there's many, many more accomplishments to come. But at this point in your life, what's the thing that you're most proud of having achieved? I'm most proud of the fact that God has trusted me to be at the start or the cornerstone or a touch point for all of these great movements in the continent. I am most proud of that. I feel as though, okay, because I'm... I'm somebody who prays a lot and, and I feel that creativity comes from the Holy Spirit. I'm very, I'm very much about that. I feel as though just being able to be involved in the South African hip hop community in the way that I have been, you know, that was amazing. And it is amazing being able to be involved in Nigeria's music industry, you know, and like working with everybody, like from Wiz to Tiwa to whoever, like that's been phenomenal. Uh, and of course, the greater African music industry as a whole, that's just amazing. I, I feel as though God strategically always places me when movements need a bit of a, you know, before they go full out, he puts me in those kind of positions. So my greatest achievement, I think, has been listening to God. And even if I don't really understand what's going on, just kind of following it. Even sometimes when I don't know that I'm following and listening. Um, yeah, that's been my greatest achievement. I, I love seeing people thrive and being at the corner of, of so many of those movements. It's, it's just, it, that's what it is. I, I, like, I, I value people and relationships more than anything else, more than um, success and, and anything like that. So it's been all of that. And it's just being seeing people go from where they are to where they are. I remember um, when we, um, when I was at Channel O, when I joined as head of Channel O Africa in 2011, and we were throwing a party at a mansion, of course, <laughs> in Lagos. And um, the person who was throwing the party plan is Chin, Oke Chin Okeke, and he owns Giddy Culture Fest, and he's now the head of Universal Music Nigeria, I believe. Uh, and I remember we're like, okay, well, I want us to have these cool invitations, but we need a song to go with this video invitation. And we picked, so I was just like, oh my gosh, somebody played me Burner Boy, like to party. I'm like, oh my gosh, I love this song. And to see where Burner is now is incredible because I remember even then being like, wow, this guy, there's something about him is going to be that far ahead. So it's just been amazing to see where all of the people are now in terms of music. And I'm in no way saying that I'm the reason why, or to see where South African hip hop is, or to see just all of those things. It's man, nothing, nothing compares to that. Even just my individual friends on a one-on-one -on -one to see how far they've gone, you know, to have been able to be part of a process or part of a team or part of a movement. That for me is my greatest achievement. And what's your greatest dream for yourself? So if you had to project out five years, like what, what's your greatest dream right now? I want to continue waking up with joy in my heart. I want to, and that's why part of the reason I say I'm in one of the best spaces I've been in, I've woken up with joy in my heart for, I mean, the last few months, which is, and, and not happiness, joy, which is so, so different. I if want I to be go there because I think a lot of people think joy, happiness, same thing. How do you define the difference in joy and happiness? Joy comes with a level of peace. So that even though things may not be as perfect, you still have a sense of peace that it's going to be okay. Happiness for me is circumstantial, you know, it's circumstantial and it relies on external factors. Joy is something that's on the inside of you. It's something that happens when, I don't know, I don't even know how it happens or when it happens for people, but I just found myself in that place where I wake up with joy in my heart all the time. Perhaps it's because when you know you're in the place that God wants you, it doesn't necessarily mean that things are, are perfect, but you're in the place you're meant to be. So I think, yeah, that, I don't know if I explained it. <laughs> you are, like truly, as, I, as you know, I'm going to go back to like just reading like all the things, all your accomplishments and all the things. You're truly such an inspiration. And I want to know for someone like you who is so inspiring to some of us who are looking at you and seeing all the things that you're achieving, who are some of the people that inspire you or what are the things that have inspired you along your journey? I think definitely my dad. I make a lot of jokes about it, but um, we lost my mom, unfortunately, when we were very young. 
And prior to that, she was a bit, she wasn't well. And um, my dad, I saw him love my mom through her sickness. And then he raised uh, three girls. Now our family is considerably bigger, but he raised three girls in a foreign country. And just seeing his, man, his love. My dad is the first, the first way that I knew that God's love was real because somebody told me that there was somebody who loved me more than what my dad did. And I'm just like, wow. And daddy loves me. He would do anything for me, literally, you know? I think sometimes I drive him a little bit like, Google, but, <laughs> you know, the love is real, he knows. Um, so my dad, definitely. Um, my sisters, because I know the journey that they've walked and just, I mean, they're incredible women, like in terms of their careers, their family lives. I really just, I'm so, I admire them so much. Um, I don't know. I'm inspired by them. And I don't know. I, I also am the kind of person who, whenever I meet somebody, I find something in them that is just so inspiring. So I feel like inspiration and being uh, inspired by people and people that you kind of admire in different ways. I don't think it's static because I don't think that any one of us can, can rule our lives in a way that we want to be the next this, or we want to be like that. You know, I think that um, every day, if you look around, there's inspiration every day and with everybody that you meet with. And of course I've, I've been in the space of like incredible people who um, I've been blessed enough to see that as awesome as they are, publicly they're also incredibly awesome internally and they've been able to sow seeds into my life but I think also it's just been like it's just ordinary people that I meet I mean I'm one of those people I look for inspiration in people and I actually remember when I was a child I used to make a joke about wanting to write a book and about everybody that I'd met because I feel like people are like walking like stories and walking life life lessons and all of that so yeah I, I literally get inspired all the time. I mean, now I'm inspired just being in Ghana. I'm inspired by the the culture, the 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 people. You know, it's just oh my gosh, yeah, the sunshine, the shea butter. <laughs> Let's go back to the shea butter. <laughs> yeah, gotta get that glow. Boom. <laughs> Now, we see a lot of the time, you know, including me looking at you and reading up about you, we see the highlights, the achievements, the the moments that have gone well that, you know, we all recognize. What have been some of the most challenging times in your life? Oh, my gosh. You know what? I feel as though my life has been like 80 percent challenging times, if not 85 percent. And like 15% of like, oh my gosh, like blessings, you know. But then with that said, I feel that everything has been a blessing, just actually making it. I've had challenging times. Losing your mom um, on the day. So my mom's birthday is the 1st of September and mine is the 2nd of September and she died on her birthday. So that meant that every year my birthday was like set up in such a way. Well, for me that it was just like, oh my gosh, like how am I even going to, you know, I was so upset. I just kept on thinking like, I was a gift to you when I came and this is the gift that you leave me. There were so many things. So that's been that, um, you know, that's obviously very challenging. That doesn't go away. I think even work-wise, it's just like, wow, the industry is really hard. It is really, really gruesome. And, and, you know, I basically started radio when I was like a teenager and everybody was like older than me. And, and I was like one of the only girls basically. And, and I was, I had like a lot of acne and like my weight was really blown out and everything. So just being in that space was so much the confidence levels, like the standards for men and women were so different. And so there was all of that. That was very challenging. Um, you know, having very public moments that were blown out and they were not true. That was so painful. And because I'm not the kind of person who will, um, will, will give a rebuttal and having people lie about you in public and then come and apologize to you in, in private and just, you know, feeling like, oh my gosh, have I embarrassed my family? Those have been really challenging moments. Um, I think even just working in the creative corporate sector is challenging. It's like, oh my gosh, like every day is a thing, you know, it really is. But the only thing that pushes you through is purpose, to be really honest. And possibly even the last two years, I think have been so hard for me. It's been really hard trying to like refine my space. So I have this podcast. It's been 
that I enjoy. And when I'm interviewing the people, I think it's fantastic. I feel like I'm in purpose. But then sometimes the the days before that and the days after, I feel like, wow, like, what am I really doing? Because, you know, now I, I live with the, with the ghost of competing with my previous self. And then everybody always saying like, oh my gosh, Lee, you do this. And I'm like, Jesus, you know? Um, and also just the challenges. I mean, I think I'm like everybody else when you have like so many ideas that you want to push forward and then you're just like, how are you going to get the funding for this? How are you going to make this happen? You know, and, and all of that. So I think it's all, it always is, but I say all that from the perspective of that, everybody's going through it, even though they look like their lives are like amazing. People are dealing a fighting battles that we don't even know, you know, so not to drag on, but even when Chadwick Bosman passed away, I had a few people call me. Uh, well, the way that I got told, I was quite shocked. I actually got told like, okay, I want you to just, there's news. It's really bad news. And I'm like, well, what's happening now? What's happening now? Um, and I think that his story is something that really touched so many people's lives because of what he was going through and nobody knew. And all the while people were making jokes on social media and passing comments and you don't know what people are going through, you know, more than anything else. I felt to myself, wow, if he could push through purpose and pain, what have I been doing that a little thing will just get me, you know, will get me, um, to kind of be like, oh, I don't want to do this anymore and not completing what it is that God has put in my heart to get started. So him, when he passed, it that's what it did. It made me realize that, because I mean, the pain he must have been in, you know, emotionally, spiritually, physically, you know, all of that. And he pushed through because he knew that he had the time that was limited, you know, and and it, it him passing away shook me because obviously he's just a major cultural shifter, but it also shook me because I felt like, that part of me that I had lost because my career started off on a really, it was like, my career was like guns blazing. I'm just like, sometimes I'm like, wow, I interviewed Oprah, you know? So all of those things, it started out so incredibly well. And, and, and it was because I, I was relentless and, and it made me feel like I need to start pursuing purpose again. So, yeah. So define that. That's such a profound thing. And that was actually for me, one of the things that struck me, like he's, I don't know him. I only Mm. You know, as an outsider, sing. But it, I was surprised by how much I felt it. And I think for me, as I was reflecting on why did this impact me, a stranger? Yes, he's in movies and whatever. But I think it's what you said about watching someone who's walking in their purpose and who's not, who doesn't allow the pain, the circumstances to stop them from really fulfilling their purpose. And you've used that word purpose a few times. So I want to ask you, what does purpose mean to you? Purpose means playing your part and doing the part that you're meant to play. Because in us playing our parts, we get people through theirs. Do you see what I mean? That's when I think of purpose, that's what I think it is. I feel as though every great and good and wonderful thing that has happened in my life, um, even the whole, like everything, like with hip hop and everything, it's been, maybe not for me, it's been for the people who I've now been able to impact, whether directly or indirectly. That's what I feel purpose is. I feel purpose is is doing what you're meant to do. You you see what I mean? Um, And sometimes that's why I feel that it is so important that people just shut off social media as much as it's a powerful tool. But I've had to do that to be able to get my mind and my life in check. And so purpose is that we'll all know what it is and it can be big. It can be small. Maybe your purpose is to be a mom, you know, or, or that sort of thing. Or it's just because, you know, it can be anything. Your purpose can just be to serve in the place that you are because your serving means that you're going to help somebody else. Who's going to help somebody else who's going to help somebody else. So playing your part in the value chain, you know, whatever that part is and doing it with integrity. You know, that is, that's, I love that definition. 